I want to thank everybody for spending part of Valentine's Day with us between uh, getting ready for a Valentine meal or uh, going out to do your backyard bird count. Uh, you're spending a little time. I want with us, I'm hoping to keep what I'm talking about to 30 minutes and knowing me, I can get much longer and something keeps popping up on my screen, which is giving me a, a pain. I don't know why. Anyway, um, Peter mentioned the fact that we are as a town, a combination of hamlets. Right now we call ourselves a town of six hamlets. But if you go back in history, actually, I don't know when we first started calling ourselves our, diff our different sections hamlets. A hamlet is a small village. And in some places, hamlets have their own political, are their own political entity. Um, but um, we're not, we're all the same town. We have one governmental supervision, which is uh, headquartered in South Salem. Over the course of the next uh, couple of months, we're going to be visiting all the six hamlets, but we decided, or I decided I'd start with Golden's Bridge as being uh, on the Western border. Next time, the end of February, we're going to Vista, which is the Eastern border. And then we're gonna kind of work our way uh, to the middle. And uh, so I hope, I'm, I hope, uh, and when Dana talked about doing this was that we can share the histories of all the hamlets with, with each other. And I'm hoping that we only that we don't only have Golden's Bridge people listening in today. I hope we have some people from the other hamlets as we go across town. And when we do the other hamlets, I hope we have Golden's Bridge people. I know from um, many years of interviewing people from one hamlet, from all the hamlets, that um, we each seem to love our town, but what we like about our town is where we live in that town. It's our, our home hamlets seem to be how we judge the town. Uh, and I know I have talked with the older senior citizens, say from Vista, uh, I've spent hours interviewing them and getting them on tape. And they'll talk about, well, I'll say, well, when's the last time you were in Golden's Bridge? And they might say 40 years. And the same thing if uh, you're talking to somebody from Golden's Bridge, well, when did you last see that person you graduated from high school with? That's when I last saw them, you know, to, to go from Golden Bridge to Vista to visit somebody you haven't seen in a long time just doesn't seem to be what what happened. So I'm hoping these different visiting the different hamlets will give people uh, the impetus to go out and and uh, and check out the other hamlets. Um, if, and before we before I turn it all the way over to the slides. A uh, little commercial, and I don't know if I can get it in here, but a lot of what I'm talking about probably you can find in the Big Blue History Book, which was written by or edited, written by a committee, but edited by a former town historian, Al Jordan, who also was uh, a former uh, supervisor of our town. And back in uh, 1981, Al got a bunch of us together and said, we need to write a book. We need to write down the history of the town. And so that's what happened. And then in 1995, I did a little, uh, I went back over it and added seven or eight um, interviews that I did with people who had been kind of, I tried to focus on parts that we didn't focus on in the, fir the first edition in 1981. So the 1994 and 95 edition of the book has some uh, personal histories of some wonderful people. And among those people were a couple from Golden's Bridge. So if you get a chance and you would like to really uh, indulge yourself in a whole lot of history, then uh, the, take, a, take a chance on the Big Blue Book, which you can buy at uh, the Lewis Brown Library or you can get it from me. Uh, and when you buy the book, all the money goes to the Lewisboro Library. So it's a good, it's a good deal. And when we first started selling the book, it was forty dollars on special. It usually goes for twenty-five. And I don't know what Cindy is asking for it nowadays. But stop by the library or contact the library if you really want a good history read. So 
um, I don't know what's going on with my computer. It just wants to keep telling me everything except what I want to talk about here. Um, putting Golden's Bridge into a nutshell, you can do that with the four R's of Golden's Bridge as I was preparing this program. Oh, Golden's Bridge is really um, centered around the four R's and those four R's are the rivers, the railroads, the reservoir, and the roads. Now we're going to start with the uh, couple of maps and uh, let me see if I can get us on to the next slide. Now the only the only picture I had uh, of the Golden Bridge sign happened to be in the history book and it says leaving Golden Bridge but ignore that we are we are starting our tour of Golden Bridge. And the one thing that comes up quite often, and uh, even the railroad contacted me about this, is where's the comma after the N? Why isn't there? Did that, did that disappear? Ah. No, I can see it. You're good. You can Maureen. see it. All right, I can't. Wait a minute. I don't know why it's doing this. We still see you and we still see the yep. picture. My, my computer keeps refreshing and going back. So I, we may have that every for whatever reason. It doesn't like being in the East Room here. Anyway, the apostrophe in Golden's Bridge, it hasn't been there for a long, long time. Um, even on a map as old as the, 16, the 1867 map, it's Golden's without the apostrophe. In fact, uh, I was reading another book and came upon the, um, the little note that during Teddy Roosevelt's time as president, the post office department just declared that um, commas were persona non, gra non gratis. And in a lot of the post offices throughout the country, the comma was taken out. So we haven't had an apostrophe for a, long, for a long time. And as I started to say, the railroad, when they were building their, uh, their commuter lots, asked me what the sign should say. And I told them no apostrophe, but from what I hear, there's an apostrophe in the sign, but I've never bothered to look. Um, the first map I'm going to show is taken from a book called The Native New Yorkers by a friend, Evan Pritchard who is uh, a Mi'kmaq Algonquin Indian. And this is a map of uh, the Hudson Valley and the different, the different villages in the Hudson Valley. And what we are concentrating on is, well, first of all, we're gonna start down here in New York City and you see this. Maureen, Maureen uh, yeah. the, the map hasn't come up. It's still oh. living Golden's Bridge, leaving Golden's Bridge. All right, okay, I've got to zoom out. Zoom in. All right. You're on not... your screen, on your screen, can you just press that arrow key to the right of oh. leaving Golden's Bridge? Yep, I did. All right, I should be able. Okay, is the map up now? No, no. Is Golden's Bridge up? Uh, leaving Golden's Bridge sign is still up. All right. No map? No map yet. All right, then something's wrong. Yeah, uh, Maureen, you're probably not sure. As I say, there's something going crazy with this. All right, I'm gonna zoom in again. For, can everybody see this now? Yes. All right, there's a word here. This is uh, says common path. Consider that Route 22 coming from the Bowery or wherever it starts on Wall Street in New York City. And when it gets up to us, we see the Kichewank River. That is the Croton River. And there are uh, these little wigwams or teepees in uh, wigwams indicate villages. The Native Americans in our area were the Kichewanks, part of the Mohegan tribe, and they were Algonquin speaking. Uh, this is the Hudson River here, and it, it's can't say that it's drawn to scale, but uh, years and years ago when the uh, 
when the uh, reservoir was down, and that must have been in the 60s, they, they had uh, drained the reservoir and you could actually see the remains of fishing weirs in the Kichewan or the Croton River that the Native Americans had built there for catching fish. So um, we know there were Indian villages in, in the area and uh, a couple in Golden Bridge, and we'll hear about more when we get to the other hamlets. Here's another map that is of interest that kind of puts you where you uh, need to be at this point. Uh, Golden Bridge was not part of the town of Lewisboro actually until 1788. Before that, it was part of Van Cortlandt Manor. And when Van Cortlandt Manor was broken up, uh, before it was broken up actually, people could not own land in here. They could uh, be tenant farmers. And then uh, toward the end of the, the, the 18th century, they started breaking up their land and selling the, selling the acreage off in 300 or 100 acre plots. And Gertrude Beekman, her uh, part of South Lot 9, Gertrude Beekman's lot became like the Todd Road, the, the Southern part of Golden Bridge. Whereas this next South Lot 9, the Bayard lots, think of this as the corridor along 138 going out. It would include the colony and Lake Katona and that part of Golden Spring. So these two lots became uh, basically what Golden Bridge is today. Here we have Lake Wakaba. So this area of Van Cortlandt Manor became part of South Salem and Wakabuck. If we can get on to the next slide. And here's the map we all know and love, the 1867 map of the town of Lewisboro. And up here is Golden's Bridge. Avery Corners is going down toward uh, Katona. And here we ha have what says on this map of 1867 is Weeks Street, like the day of the week. Uh, that's probably because it was named for a couple of Weeks families. And here's a J Weeks, and I believe there's another Weeks in here. But uh, this would be going out, well, here, here is the railroad, because the railroad was here, it came in the 1840s. But this is what is now the end of Todd Road that comes out and meets uh, Route 22. If you follow Week Street down, and then you're going to come to Lake Daytona, and, and you're going to follow it out, and you're going to get uh, to the area where the Todds lived. And here's a Todd. This becomes Todd Road. And so I think the reason it's not Week Street anymore is the Todds kind of became more prevalent than the Weeks. But I'm thinking when I first came to town in the in the middle 60s, there was a little part of Todd Road, which goes out to Route 138. And uh, that was still called Week Street. But now the whole thing, I think this is uh, Todd Road. Here's probably my last map of, of the town of Golden's Bridge. And uh, this map was done by Ed Kieran, who was our highway superintendent back before uh, there was Steve Waterbury and then Steve Hill, and now we have Pete Ripperger. But when Ed, Ed happened to live in Golden's Bridge and he took a great deal of pride in being a Golden's Bridger and a Lake Katona man. And for the uh, bicentennial in 1976, Increase Miller's school PTA wrote a wonderful book uh, called Spanning, Spanning the Years. And Ed drew this map for that for that book. And he started with that Beers map, which I just showed you, and kind of uh, intensified just the Golden's Bridge area. And the, the part of the map that's in, uh, in Broken Line was not here in 1867. That is the reservoir. So here's the Croton River or the Kitchewank River, as it was called when the Native Americans had named it. Uh, here's the town line between uh, Somers and, uh, and our town. 
This is actually, this is looking north. This is looking south. And this is looking west, and this is east. This is what I always call the Fisherman's Road. It's the road by the reservoir. Here is where the, uh, the, bridge, the, the metal bridge is. That's now a historic landmark. Uh, and here is 138 going, going towards Somers and JFK. Now, as I said, this is what I call the Fisherman's Road. But this was the road you would have taken to walk or ride your buggy into Katona. And you, would, you could have gotten all the way into the old town of Katona. On the old Fisherman's Road used to be uh, a cemetery, a friend, a Quaker cemetery, and next to the cemetery was a friend's meeting house. Now, when the, uh, the uh, New York City started condemning property and moving, moving property, the friend's meeting house was, was abandoned in the cemetery. The graves in the cemetery were moved to the Amawak Cemetery. Here you see Old Bedford Road. Now it's in broken lines, so it wasn't there in 1867. It looks like the road stopped here. Uh, these are the houses along Old Bedford, well, going into Old Bedford Road, Park Avenue, and then down here, we'll see some pictures of the buildings that were down by the, uh, the railroad. Hopefully we can get back to some of these maps if you have questions, but uh, it might be, we had such a long time getting started. It Director, so might not have time. <laughs> okay, I think, I think we have to get tested before we go down to the game. Do you? Yeah. What if you had your... Okay, this is the Todd Homestead on uh, on Todd Road, and it was built after the Revolutionary War. The Todds came to town from the Greenwich, New England area after the Revolution, although Abraham Todd did serve in the Revolution. Uh, he's not mentioned in our history book as a Revolutionary soldier because he didn't serve from this town. Now, whoops, I seem to be missing. There. The Brady House. This the, this is the house that everybody everybody knows because it's right on Dead Man's Curve there on 138. It's a beautiful yellow a yellow mansion that stands overlooking uh, the highway and your entrance into the Golden Bridge area. Um, the Bradys came here also from the Greenwich the Greenwich area, but they were here before this, the the. Uh, the Revolutionary War, and Simeon did serve in the militia during that war. While he was out uh, on militia duty, uh, we well, to go back one sentence, where we live in this part of uh, Westchester County, which lies between Peekskill and the Bronx, it's kind of known as a no man's land, and it was subject to marauders called Cowboys and Skinners. The Skinners were the Patriots, and the Cowboys were the English. And during, now it, it was not this house, it was a much smaller house because this house was built around 1800. But the house that Simeon left to, to fight in the war and leave his wife and quite a number of children behind uh, was visited twice, at least twice. Once by the cowboys, the Tories, who ransacked the house, ransacked the farm, took the cattle off to uh, serve as uh, sustenance for the British troops and stole anything that they could get their hands on that was of any value. Um, sometime after that, the uh, uh, militia, the American militia stopped by the Brady house and uh, asked Mrs. Brady if she'd, she'd help. And if, since they were the Patriots, she was more than happy to help. And excuse me, what she did was help make bullets while they took care of the children. Apparently they passed the crying baby from one to the other as Mrs. Brady was busy uh, heating, up, heating up the lid for the bullets. Now we are coming, we're going to leave, uh, since there's not that much to talk about during any of the revolutionary or the civil wars, um, we're going to go into some of the changes that Golden Bridge has gone through. And the first big change was probably in the 1840s 
when the railroad came to town about 1880, uh, 1847. And I don't think this was probably not the first, uh, definitely not the first railroad station that was built, but this was the one around 1900 or a little later. And note the architecture of this building because you're going to see it again pretty soon. Uh, there were several waves of immigrants that came through Golden's Bridge, probably more through Golden's Bridge than the other hamlets. And the first one were the Irish because the Irish were the railroad workers. And so in the 1840s, you see the, um, the beginning of a wave of, of Irish people. And uh, uh, some of the, those old families, I think remnants of those families are still here. Uh, remember I said when I showed one of the other maps that down close to the railroad, there are a couple of interesting buildings. This is the New York store which uh, is, I guess, I don't know if this is Park, I forget the names of the roads, but Old Bedford Road is back here. And if you come down right close to the railroad tracks and actually the, the, uh, the uh, fence is probably right about here. This was the New York store, which was the gathering place for anybody who needed any to buy anything or shoot the time of day or perhaps get the mail. Uh, this is where you, where you would come. And obviously there are living quarters above it. This is in quite disrepair right now, but it, it's too bad. It was it a was, um, uh, boarding house and apartments for a while. And right now it's, I don't even, I don't think anybody's living there anymore, but I don't know. Next to that, is the Cal what was called the Callahan Hotel. And this is also still there. This was uh, a hotel during the late 19th century when Golden's Bridge, as Peter mentioned, we were a summer resort. Um, so we had several, several boarding houses where in Cross River and in Golden's Bridge where, and in Wakabuck where people would come to spend a few weeks, get away from the doldrums of New York City and the typhoid and the cholera and all of the diseases that were being caused by the, the, uh, the trash and the terrible conditions of uh, the garbage accumulation in the city. So Callahan's Hotel was a place you could come. Now this building is kind of hard to believe. Now let, this is an addition, but this building was one of the buildings moved when the reservoir came in around 1900 and they started condemning the land. This was one of the buildings moved. In early history books, the Katona history said that this was one of Washington's headquarters during the Revolutionary War, but uh, more research indicated that it was not. And at that point, if it was Washington's headquarters, it would have been located on where the reservoir is. It would have been before this was moved but down to Old Bedford Road. Now we're going to uh, a little more modern times. I'm not sure when this building was taken down, but the road is paved. This is Main Street in Golden Spurs. This is the fire department. The fire department was organized in 1909. It's the oldest fire department in our town. And uh, this was a great meeting place. Uh, I think even the Girl Scouts and the Cub Scouts or uh, the Campfire Girls met perhaps upstairs, uh, because I have pictures of, of that. But you can see it was definitely a, a going little town. It had a drugstore, it had a liquor store, it had an A&P, and we'll see the A&P a little bit later, but this is uh, going through some of the changes. Now here's that fire department. Uh, and as I said, that was organized in 1909. So we're going, this is the post office. This was the post office at, in that same era. Uh, but look, you came to get your mail in your, in your, uh, in your carriage with, your, uh, with your, your horse and cart. There were not that many cars around, even though the road seems to be paved. Um, there were a few cars, but people still traveled. Not everyone had a car and people still traveled in their, in their buggies. Right, this, as we, as I said, is we're getting into the early 20th century, and this is, I have many postcards of the lake. Nobody called it the reservoir, 
but this is part of the Croton Reservoir in Golden Bridge, and it was a great place to go have a picnic, go fishing, uh, go boating, and I think you can, I don't know which little cove this picture was taken in, but this is circa the first decade or so of the 20th century after the gates were closed and the dam were holding back the water, which happened around 1906, 1907. Uh, you can see how uh, open the land was around, around there. People loved to use their lake as recreation. And it also was uh, the, same, the same recreation for people who would come up from the city and spend a couple of weeks. Here's our famous double truss bridge that was uh, resurrected from uh, a site in, in uh, Poughkeepsie and brought, and brought down and installed here because the reservoir, the bridge that had been over the Croton River was too small and they needed a longer bridge. Right now, you couldn't even walk across this bridge, but uh, in the summertime, according to Steve Waterbury, one of our former uh, highway superintendents, and I'm sure he had a lot of friends, was great for jumping off of and going for a swim. Here's our boy, Tony. We took this uh, the day they, they uh, dedicated the sign, declaring this a National Historic Landmark. And I think this might be Peter DeLuca, and I, Thinking I see a half of Jonathan Monty back yeah, here. Yeah, that's, but that's Jim, Jim Morio. Oh, that's John Jim Morio. Okay. Right. Okay. Sorry about that. But uh, we, it was a very cold day, but the sign got dedicated. And uh, uh, it's one of a couple of the historic landmarks in our town. And a beautiful, beautiful, uh, if you like to take pictures, it's a beautiful place to take pictures. Um, now we're coming to the, there were several churches in Golden's Bridge. This is the Methodist Episcopal Church. And this church uh, had to be moved when the reservoir came to town. So they got it ready to move, got it up on its, on its uh, equi moving equipment. And a big wind came along, it fell off the equipment. It landed on the ground in uh, quite a bunch of pieces. So that was the end of, um, it was a, the move as the church as a whole, but they did gather the pieces up and get it across the railroad tracks and get it down into uh, uh, on 138, the old 138, where it was built as a newer church. I didn't put in a picture of what it is now, but you can see it if you look to your right as you uh, or look to the north as you cross the the highway bridge on 138. It's down there now. It is a, uh, a veterinary establishment with its uh, uh, the the manse. The uh, the rectory is right next to it. So uh, it was the reincarnation of the Methodist Episcopal Church. And then on Increase Miller Road uh, was Herman Chapel, which was another Methodist Episcopal Church, and it was built uh, in 1828 served the town for a long, long time. Uh, it also, it was next to the um, Herman, the Herman Chapel School, the one room schoolhouse. Uh, by the way, this was condemned and uh, taken down in 1946. And it stood right uh, near the, the Brady Cemetery and what the Brady Cemetery has since been moved, but the uh, Increase Miller Cemetery is still, is still there. And this is on Increase Miller Road, right across from, uh, I think it's Cornwall Court, the road to Cornwall Court is the, the general area. This is the, uh, whoops, wrong one, we gotta go back. This is the uh, Herman Chapel One Room School, which was built in 1825. And that's right next to the chapel that you saw. Uh, in the former picture. And uh, this was in use until the in uh, was built in 1825. It was in use until the 1890s when the next Golden's Bridge one room schoolhouse was built. And this one was built sort of in the, uh, the area uh, where 
the last one room schoolhouse was built, which actually was a two room schoolhouse. So this was built in 1893 and in use until 1911. When this one was built, this is the one that Dana has fond recollections of because this is where the park and rec had their offices until they were moved over to Onatru Farm. Uh, and uh, we were commenting on what was the same and what had changed. Uh, the park and rec did not have the use of this cute little porch, but pretty much everything else is the same. And it didn't have uh, our wonderful ground screw to uh, mow the grass, at least not for this picture. So this was in use from 1911 until uh, Increase Miller was built in, uh, oh, I'm sorry, well, Increase Miller was 1963. Uh, before that, they were, the, the kids went down to Katona Elementary after Katona Elementary was built in the 1940s. Now we're going back to the Herman Chapel, Herman Chapel School area on Increase Miller Road. Uh, this is the Simeon Brady Jr. It's part of the pedestal for his gravestone. <clears throat> and people thought that, uh, well, around 1912 or 1913, Edward Brady decided to move. He, he was a principal in the Ivendale Cemetery over in Somers. And so he decided to move all of the Brady family graves, which were right behind the stone wall, <coughs> excuse me, to the Ivendale Cemetery where they are today. And he, for some reason, they just left this pedestal. And this is in front of the fence. And uh, if you know Ken Elden, Elden this is uh, his house. This is where, where Ken and his family live. But the cemetery, uh, was right here behind the fence. And then behind that cemetery is the Increase Miller Cemetery, where Increase Miller and Hannah Miller and about 60 other people from Golden's Bridge are buried. Very interesting cemetery. And it makes you wonder why people always built cemeteries on hillsides. Because as you walk that cemetery, you definitely go down a steep incline or decline. Now we're back to some changes in Golden's Bridge proper. We're back here, you can see the firehouse. Uh, judging from the automobiles in this picture, I would say we are probably in the late 1920s, early or the 1930s. And uh, we see the drugstore. There are several, there were quite a number of gas stations along here. And then you go on up the hill, this is looking, this is looking toward, uh, the north, it's going out of town that way, the north, but it's it's Route 22. We call uh, the Golden's Bridge, people call it Main Street, but it uh, strangers would call it Route 22 when they're on their way up to the Berkshires. There's another, another view, uh, looking again, looking north. I think this is probably past uh, where we were looking just before. This is the Green Brothers store, uh, right? Behind the store are the railroad tracks. And I think this area here is what Steve Waterbury told me was the baseball field, which uh, in the great hurricane and flood of 1955, this whole area was totally flooded. But here we're looking toward the Green Brothers store and we are looking toward uh, highway 138 and then on toward the north. Oh, and I see all these wires here, which reminds me, Golden's Bridge did not have electricity until the early 1930s. Here is Green Brothers store, the corner of their store, which was the store for everything from farm equipment to probably uh, penny candy and, and uh, baked beans. This, this is Route 138. This was one of the crossings. There were three, at least three railroad crossings between 138 and down toward Katona. And they saw their number of accidents, several of them fatal. This one had a particularly bad fatal accident, uh, as well as another one, which was an unmarked uh, crossing down 
on the uh, Todd property down toward Avery Corners, um, where two people were killed. And here, a woman, a woman was killed in uh, a car. The Golden's Bridge people for quite a while had been uh, requesting the supervisor to request the railroad to put up a, a better signal at the crossing. They wanted, uh, there are no, there are no uh, gates to come down here. And the railroad, even with all the, uh, the uh, petitions and things decided that, well, it doesn't quite meet our criteria for putting in gates. And so uh, uh, we suffered a little longer. In fact, suffered until the 1960s when the uh, 684 went in and the new highway bridge was built. This is a picture from 1964 <clears throat> when uh, 684 was about to barrel its way through. And this was the demolishment of Green Brothers, which had stood there since the late 1800s. Uh, this was the site I saw as I was commuting from White Plains to Carmel to teach up in Carmel during my early teaching career. And uh, uh, it was a sad site indeed, even though I didn't really know the town of Lewis Brawl back then. It was it was sad to see a town totally demolished. I, uh, Ma Maureen, sorry, sorry to interrupt, but someone just uh, posted a question. Jane Zeiler is asking, was the Green Brothers store the same as the New York store? No, uh, you could tell by the architecture. Um, Green Brothers was a tall uh, square building. Mm -hmm. I, I really don't want to go back too often, but. The New York store is the one that's currently standing today, right? That used to. Yep. Oh, it's way, there. okay, it's there. It looks that the one, same, yeah. except it's all falling apart. I think this is Park. This is the road. There's a flagpole corner. Um, yeah, on old I think, Edford Road. I think that's there's North a road Street. To, okay. That's North Street. That that's used North to Street. come across before 684 was built. Right, right. It was right. a crossing. Yeah. Right. And then over here is Callahan's Hotel. Mm hmm. Okay, I'll find my way back. But it'd be okay. better to have questions at the end. Okay. Otherwise, it's gonna take very long. And my voice is already going. All right, goodbye, Green. Hello, AMP. This was, I don't know whether it was Westchester's smallest AMP, but uh, Tony, when you put up that Lions Charter yesterday, I didn't read much further than the Bs, the Brays, and then, uh, John Beeman, uh, John Benish, John Benish, or Jack, I think he was known better as, mm -hmm. was the manager of the AMP food store. Uh, while it was here, his wife, Dorothy, had a, a, a beauty salon across the street until 684 took that and then she worked out of her home. Jack, when 684 took this AMP, he was the first manager in 1969 when it opened its new store with the urban renewal up on. Uh, where it is today. But Jack really liked to keep his customers uh, pleased. And so often I think he would close the store at lunchtime. And if there were with a meat order or a meat order, uh, an order he couldn't fill, he would close the store during his lunch, run down to the AMP in Katona, get the produce or the meat or whatever was needed and bring it back to the AMP store up here. Uh, one time in one of those missions, he was at the bank in Katona. The bank was robbed and anybody in the bank at the time was locked into the uh, vault, not the vault, but into the freezer. And so poor Jack did not get back to open the AMP on time. But that's the kind, that's the kind of service you got in Golden's Bridge. One other story about the AMP before I leave it, we're going a little later, quite soon, actually, to uh, talk about the Bondies. Uh, and Mrs. Bondi was, I guess, quite a character, well-known around town. But she would call in her order from her 300-acre estate, and then she would drive down to the AMP to pick up her. She was kind of uh, like we're doing in the pandemic now, and she got her curbside delivery. Well. She wasn't the world's best driver, but she drove a nice big car. And one day in coming to pick up her groceries, she uh, 
kind of missed the side, missed the curb and went into the store. Not too far, I guess, not too much was, was uh, disheveled, but they got the car back out of the store and got Mrs. Bondi your groceries and she went home, give them to the cook to cook the dinner. Here's some more of the rubble as they were uh, putting through 684. Now, I told you to take a look at that railroad station. Here it is, right here, is that old Golden Springs Railroad Station, which was bought around 19, a little after 1900, 19 early decades. Ed Brady bought the railroad station or for a dollar or something and had it moved over to Route 22. And it became the Red Eagle Tavern when he owned it. A little later, it was sold to um, another another family and it became Fritz's Tavern. Um, for those of you who haven't lived in Golden's Bridge for more than 20 years or since 84, a 684 came through, Golden's Bridge was known as a cowboy kind of a town. It was basically bars, bars and gas stations. It had one bank, I guess, uh, NBW, I think it was, whatever bank it was that Al Jordan, our supervisor, worked for. Well, uh, Al Jordan was a banker and he told me one time that he was uh, bringing one of the bank's banking uh, personnel from the White Plains area up to look at the bank in Golden's Bridge. And the poor guy thought he was going to be uh, accosted by some sort of banditos as he came into town because it looked like a real shoot em up rural western kind of a town, which it may have been. There certainly were a lot of bars. I'm still planning to do a bar and speakeasy tour and Golden's Bridge will be the end of that. And that's what we look like today. All of Golden's Bridge is under a lot of concrete. There's the railroad bridge. I mean, the uh, highway bridge that uh, repurposed 138. <coughs> Now, the um, another another uh, area of, of interest are the uh, the summer resort areas in the 1920s, 1927. About uh, farms were starting to oh, in the 1920s, farms were starting to uh, to be less looked on favorably. It was hard to uh, to uh, get your milk to market, and also uh, laws were coming in that required pasteurization, which required a lot of other, other things and made it harder for the, the, these very rural farms to make, to make it. So farms were going uh, to developers and developers from White Plains bought this property uh, around a lake, improved the lake and a 1927 Lake Dakota was, was born. I love this picture. It came from Jean Kieran, who was head of the map Kieran's wife, uh, and it's from up on one of the hills. So you get a good look down at the lake and the clubhouse and how very open it all was. A few trees here, but still open. And now it's uh, home to a lot of people. It was a summer, basically summer places had a little trouble during the 30s, as did the other lake communities in town, because it was a depression. So things kind of slowed down as uh, the lake community progressing too far with more with mo more owners, but that survived. That uh, turned around after World War II, and by the end of the 40s, early 50s, people were coming, building uh, full-time homes and. Uh, so much so that in 1963, Increase Miller had to be, was, was built. Here's the colony, which also started at about the same time, about 1927. The colony was looked somewhat on somewhat askance back then in the, in the late 20s because it was an ethnic community. It was basically Jewish, people of Jewish, um, ethnicity coming up from New York and the Bronx uh, to have their place in the summer. And uh, they bought a farm from a man named Mr. Lieberman on 138, off of 138. And this was a very small lake. It was about an eight acre lake or uh, in a very swampy area that was dammed up. 
and made into uh, a collective community at first. You uh, could buy could buy shares uh, for seven hundred dollars, and it, you could you could start off at, with a hundred dollars down, and then each year pay another hundred dollars, and at the end of seven years or so, or whenever you got up to seven hundred dollars, you would have your your property. And for a, for a number of years, people just lived in tents on that property, on their property. Uh, and more and more uh, people then, after, as, as time went by, were able to build their houses. And today, it's one of my favorite communities to drive through because it's so eclectic. And the architecture, well, people are adding on now, so it's becoming a little more um, uh, less less eclectic and, and, and more modern, but there are so many different kinds of homes in this area. It was um, in its in its collective fairly uh, uh, combined uh, uh, contained community until the end of of the 1930s going into the 1940s. It was the first area in town actually to have a community day camp, and uh, uh, it was very forward thinking in in a lot of ways. And now, now it's 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 no longer uh, uh, one ethnic group. It's it's open. It's open to everybody. It's it's quite uh, uh, and an, an a welcoming community. But it was the beginning of many things that, like as I say, a day camp, which now we Dana runs one of the world's best day camps. But back then, <clears throat> in the '30s, there wasn't one, and these people started one. All right, here we are to uh, not not the, the summer people and not the community, the co uh, collective community people, but the folks who like to build their castles on the hill. This is the Richard Bondi estate, which, <clears throat> excuse me, I saw in one in one article I read they had three hundred and and fifty acres. In another article I read they had over four hundred acres. Uh, whatever it was in the 1920, late 1920s, Richard Bondi, who was um, an important member of the General Tobacco Company, uh, decided to build this mansion. The mansion <clears throat> was 20,000 square feet. You probably fit a small cal uh, Costco inside there today. Uh, it had a living room. Well, it had a carriage house. It had um, uh, a farm, which was called Wild Oaks. He called it Wild Oaks and the farm was called Wild Oaks and they had their own farm animals. They had cattle, they had horses, they had sheep, they had all of that. <clears throat> Mrs. Bondi raised uh, hunting, uh, hunting dogs and the kennels and some of the, the farm buildings are where Wild Oaks uh, Village is today, not Wild, not Wild Oaks, the big Wild Oaks community with the uh, with the condos and, and the standalones, but uh, the Wild Oaks Village, which is a, across from the firehouse. All right, here's the outside of the Bondi estate. Here's the living room, 1400 square foot <clears throat> living room. Guess you don't have to worry about the dust up in the rafters. But it was the unfortunate part of this that, that was finished about 1929, but Richard Bondi had died before it was finished. But his wife, as I mentioned before, the wife of the, the AMP incident and his two children did live here until uh, it was sold when she passed away. But on one of a very cold January night in uh, 1968, the Bondi house caught on fire and was totally destroyed. This is a picture from the front page of the ledger of that fire. So that was the end of the Bondi, the Bondi estate as an estate. And then it, <clears throat> it was sold to George Ozolowski. Oh, there's a milk bottle from the Wild Oaks Dairy Farm, Olden's Bridge. Before I get there, I just, wanted to, <clears throat> to say um, the Bondi estate was after Mrs. Bondi passed away, uh, it was sold. 
gold first to George Arzharovsky, who was the one who developed that Wild Oaks community. And then he leased it to a man named Marshall Karlbaum. Marshall Karlbaum wanted to make, he renamed it Falcon Rock. This was before the fire. I shouldn't have showed you the fire yet. Uh, before the fire, he wanted to have uh, a getaway for people who wanted to come and spend a couple of weeks in the country. Uh, he was going to have hunting lodges. He made it into, uh, uh, you could come and make believe you were king for a day at his, in, up in his medieval, his medieval mansion called Falcon Rock. But he didn't get too far with that because that was in 1964 that he leased it. But in 1960s, before, well, in 1967, he sold, George Orzelowski sold the property to a man named Frank Lonzello from White Plains or Nur I think Nurichel, who decided to turn Falcon Rock into a restaurant. And the restaurant opened in 1967. And if we go back, the, house, the restaurant caught on fire in 1968. So restaurant did not last very long, nor did the mansion. Lately, uh, well, in the 90s, it was bought again and redone, put back in slightly smaller fashion. And it's now uh, a 6,000 square foot abode. There's, there's the famous Balanced Rock of uh, Golden Bridge, and it is in the woods. I know some of you know where it is. Um, when John, whoops, when John Lally took me to to see it, we went up from the parking lot by the post office in Golden Bridge, and through the woods. And it's kind of in the area that overlooks going toward the colony. So. Uh, I'm sure it's still there. I don't think it's bounced away. Uh, and I'm sure there are people who as kids or maybe even later than kids have gone to visit it. But we're very happy. We're very proud to have our own balanced rock in our town. This is something that has uh, got me kind of upset a few years ago. Um, I hope some of you remember, this was on Todd Road. It, the watering trough that was been that had been there for for at least a century, because it offered a place for people driving their their horses, either traveling through town, uh, or just going from one place to another nearby. They could stop and water their horses there, and it stood there uh, in all its glory for many many years, and then somebody in town bought the property. Uh, a number of acres, that's the property that you can see behind the stone wall. And for, I went by one day and saw that the trough was missing. So I uh, ended up calling the owner, the new owner of this property he said, oh yeah, I didn't know what that was. I didn't like it there. So I moved it and I don't know what has happened to it. I don't know whether he actually did move it up to his property. He no longer owns his property. I don't know if the trough is up there uh, or if the trough was broken up and, and just done away with. But it was, it was a sad day that this landmark for no reason really uh, was just done away with. Oh, okay, this is where I'm not sure the children want to be involved. I forgot I was going to do a little- Ma Maureen, I was told the children are not on. The ones oh, good. I thought would be on. Oh, okay, well, here we are. Here we have, uh, this is not a resident of Goldman's Bridge. Some of you may recognize her. This is the great Betty Page, who was a famous pinup of the 1940s and 50s, kind of the Betty Grable of the uh, modeling and bondage a bondage group. Uh, Betty Page was actually a very famous model and uh, in during the, that era and was you might have you might see her image on uh, hot rods on trucks on even I'm told maybe maybe some of the uh, airplanes in the service people would put a picture of paint get a picture of Betty Page painted on on there on their planes or their vehicles. Well, 
back in the 40s and the early 50s, there were, it was kind of a, a weekend business where uh, photographers, uh, photographers, there were photographers clubs. They would come out of New York City to come up to the country to do some photo shoots. And one of the places they liked to come up to in this kind of the country was a farm in Golden's Bridge. And one day this gentleman uh, who was a fairly famous band leader and photographer in Harlem, his name was, was Cass Carr. He had a group of, he would bring these groups up every weekend. And the one weekend in July, Cass Carr and a group of about 10 or 15 amateur male photographers and a bevy of pinup girls or models came up to Golden's Bridge and did uh, an, uh, a photo shoot in the nude on this Golden's Bridge farm. Turned out somebody near the farm or going by really didn't like what was going on. So the sheriff was called. So the Westchester County Sheriff showed up with, his, with a couple of his uh, deputies and they hid in the bushes during the photo shoot for a couple of hours and uh, trying to figure out, I guess, the best way to uh, get, uh, get uh, hold of these, these perpetrators. So after a couple of hours, Betty decided that she really needed a bathroom break. So she went over to the bushes and out jumped the trooper, out jumped the sheriff's deputies, arrested Cass, arrested the men, arrested the models, got uh, and made them all, uh, arrested them for the ladies for indecent exposure and the men for uh, disturbing the peace. They all appeared before Judge John Aiken, who was uh, uh, our justice of the peace at that time. And uh, the, they were all fined. And Betty did not like the idea of being uh, arrested for indecent exposure. Uh, so she, she uh, managed to work, work her, her crime down to uh, just uh, disturbing the peace and was let off at that way. This all happened on July 27th in 1952. Judge Aiken made the photographers sign a piece of paper that said they would never do these photo shoots in Westchester County again. Uh, there's a lot to, to know about Betty Page, which we're not going to go into right now, but she's easy to look up <clears throat> online. She even ended up, ended up uh, being called to testify before the, one of the Kefauver committees during uh, the 1950s for uh, 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 whatever indecent, indecent public display or something. But that's our story of Betty Page, not, not a, uh, didn't live in Golden Bridge, but um, certainly made the news in Golden Bridge. Unfortunately, she went on hard times toward the end of her life, had a couple of breakdowns, and died in California in 2005. Here we go to next picture. This is uh, a picture of a gentleman who has come up a lot recently on uh, go on Facebook websites. This is Captain Jinkus Gary, who was the hermit of Todd Road. <clears throat> uh, there is so much to talk about, uh, about this gentleman that we really, again, don't have a lot of, a lot of uh, enough time to do that. But he did serve in the United States um, Army during World War II, and he was an important uh, person after the war as an interpreter when the Russians, the Germans, and the Americans were uh, would be meeting in their various conferences toward the end of the war and at the end of the war. His family came to Golden's Bridge uh, probably in the 1930s, and his father was an equestrian and had a, a riding rink in Central Park decided to get out of the city and he found this property here through a friend in Golden's Bridge and he started Little Outlaw Lodge. Uh, well, 
there used to be a sign that said Little Elwa Lodge, and that's where they lived. And then they had their riding rink across the street on uh, on uh, Odd Road. So this is a picture of the colonel of the captain in his uniform. Here he is in the riding rink across across the the way uh, on Todd Road, riding one of the horses. Now the uh, the Garys were from the Caucasus. They were they were uh, really related to the Cossacks, and his father was was a prince, Cossack prince. Uh, captain Gary. Well, let's see. Let me go on, and then now, Cap well, Captain Gary never lost the the love of his Russian heritage, and he was a fairly good artist. And this is one of the pictures. I have a whole banker's box full of pictures that were given to me after the captain the captain died. He also died in um, two thousand five, uh, and he was the man who people called the hermit of of Todd Road. He lived in a concrete shack on the north side of Todd Road, kind of toward the 121 uh, end of Todd Road. He lived there for many years. He had given up driving a car after his mother died and he inherited all the property. He just kind of decided to back off from the world and uh, did not live in, in the house where uh, he had been living, went to live in this concrete bunker, which uh, had no, uh, it have a, did not have central heating. It had a, a pot bellied stove. It did have running water, uh, but that's where he decided to spend the rest of his, his years. He rode a bike and many people probably saw him on his bike. He usually had a, a long leather coat on. So he was our 20th century version and 21st century version of the leather man. Now here's one, he had thousands of pictures of these dancers, but he also was pretty good at drawing horses. Now, he lived close to the land. He, he had money, but he was not going to spend it. And uh, as witness to no car that worked and the bicycle that served him very well. But as you can kind of see through this picture, all of his drawings were on the back of AMP uh, handouts because these would come in the mail. And why make, why just throw them away when you can use the back for these drawings? And as I say, I have a banker's box full of these drawings and of his letters, which uh, are incredible to read through. He went to uh, a finishing school, uh, or uh, uh, what do you call it? A, he went to, I forget the school now, I should know it, it should be on the top of my, my mind because he then went to Yale. He did not graduate from Yale, he went into the, into the army. But he did write this book and it, The Shadow of Power about his, uh, his family's Cossack uh, beginnings and also about his, his work in World War II. But for some reason, he decided to just back off from, uh, life as, <clears throat> as he knew it. And, and uh, although he did have a shortwave radio and he did keep in touch with everything that was going on in the world and he wasn't really happy with it. And he would <clears throat> send off uh, uh, letters to uh, various people he heard on the radio to complain about what they were talking about and give his opinions, which were many. Here is a picture I took um, I think probably three years ago of his, when I was doing, I did a whole program uh, on interesting people of Lewisboro a couple of years ago at the library. And that's when I took this picture. And uh, as I said, he died in 2005. And so this was probably 10 years or so after his death. And it had just kind of gone to rack in the room. It had been totally vandalized. Uh, but so I decided, okay, I'm gonna go up and take some pictures. There was a wooden building out behind. Uh, I visited him several times in this, in this uh, uh, concrete home of his. Once, uh, I guess both times maybe with Maureen Carpenter, who was a friend who was a very good friend of the captain's and kept him, uh, would give him her copies of the New York Times. So he kept up with the Times. Uh, but, 
Maureen asked if he would uh, meet with me because I was writing my book about images of Lewisboro. Uh, he wouldn't let me take a picture of himself and he wouldn't let me record him. So I had to just scribble notes. Uh, but he, in, he invited Maureen and me, the two Maureens to tea. He made bread on his pot-bellied stove for us and had his tea, uh, a, wonder, a wonderful little uh, shack in the woods tea. Then Maureen, unfortunately, she was she got called out to an appointment that she had to meet somebody. So he was left with your present Maureen. And I happened to, uh, so we talked for a while and then I noticed that at one end of the shack down in here was a baby grand piano. And so I said, oh, do you play? Could you play for me? And he went and sat down at the piano and was very accommodating. I cannot remember what he played, but he did play some, a few, a couple of classical pieces. And that was a very, very kind of bizarre visit to be sitting in a concrete shack, listening to a very out of tune baby grand piano with this wonderful gentleman playing it. This is the picture the day that I went to take pictures for my program. There's the baby grand piano. You can see what the end of um, the Colonel's life after the Colonel left, what happened to his, to his legacy. It's just a really, <clears throat> uh, it's a very un unfortunate thing. He was buried in the South Salem Cemetery. So uh, if you ever want to go visit, it's kind of near the front of the cemetery. It's down uh, closer to the, uh, the parking lot by the, by the police station. But this is his father, Panir Azama, and his mother, Vagid uh, Sharatlak. She was a librarian, I believe, at Smith College. So they were a very, very educated family. Um, however, uh, the captain just decided to give it up and uh, uh, live in his own world, which he, he did get to meet many, many people. And uh, if any of those people would like to share information with me so I can add it to my files of uh, the captain, I would love to make an appointment to meet with you. And here's the book that uh, I mentioned earlier on, that was the uh, bicentennial project of the PTA of the Increase Miller School. It's called Golden Spirit Spanning the Years. I hope they've republished it, I don't know. But uh, anytime that I visited the school and talked to the principal, a couple of the principals didn't even know it existed. Uh, so I, I told them about it and I suggested that it would make a really good PTA present uh, 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 pro, uh, not a program, but something for the PTA to, to, to redo because it is jam-packed uh, of information about Golden Spirit. So I think I finally really out-talked myself. Uh, we had a slow start, but I still talked for about uh, well more than 30 minutes. So uh, if anybody has... Uh... Yeah, Maureen, we got four questions um, through the chat feature. Okay, that's good. First uh, one I'm, I'm... is on the maps, the property map that you showed in the beginning. Okay. Uh, there are crumbling stone walls behind the woods in Increase Miller between Cornell Court and the school. Right. Do you know the history of the stone walls? I mean, I, I, I'm guessing they're property boundaries. Well, they are now. They probably were just pastures, you know, marking the... Uh, the Brady farm, there was a Brady farm up there. There was the Increase Miller farm. I mean, I used to teach at Increase Miller and I'd be out in the playground. Uh, and I know you could look right over and see the houses on Cornwall Court. So I think those were their property boundaries now, but back then that was all pasture. So it would have been marking people. I mean, they, they mark different pastures for keeping their different you know, they move their cows from one pasture to another for new, new uh, food, new grasses. So I, I, I think that's all. I mean, 
I don't think they go back. Sometimes the, the, the Indians built stone walls, but uh, uh, I don't think they go back that far. I think they go back to the 1800s, night, early 1900s. Okay, next one was on the Brady estate slide. Did anyone famous ever live in the Brady home after the Brady's lived there? After the Brady's lived, I don't know of anybody famous. Uh, Ed Casati lives there now. His, unfortunately, his wife passed away a couple of years ago. Um, but I, in between, I don't, I don't, I don't know who the interim people were. Okay. If somebody does and they know that they're famous and they can share it with us, but I don't, I don't know. And it's an incredible place. It was a cider mill. It was um, uh, probably a grist mill. The cider, he would sell his cider, the Brady cider would get sold in New York City. It would go by the train. Um, it would be taken, his, his kegs of cider would go to the, the depot in Golden's Bridge and then go into New York City. Next so, one was on the Bondi house. Where and what street was the Bondi house located on? And I know some people helped out with that answer. But okay. we'll hear from you too. Oh, well, if you go up Manor Drive, that was the, um, I think that was the original, the start of the driveway. It's a very long driveway. And you go up just up to the end. Now they've, all that property has been sold off so that it's now houses. But that's, it was, it was that area off of, uh, of 138. That's where you go up. I mean, I know my husband and I did a lot of exploring after the fire, but uh, that's the last time. Then they, they closed it off because somebody bought the property and uh, you couldn't really do what I like to do is go exploring, put on my historian's hat and go where I shouldn't go. <laughs> well, here's one that will be the, the answer to that, the next question. But the Balanced Rock and Golden's Bridge is different, is definitely different than the well-known North Salem Balancing Rock. Yeah. Where is the one located in Golden's Bridge? But I know it's probably on private property, so. No, I don't think so. I mean, oh. I just said, uh, I said, when John Lally, who was the gentleman from Golden's, from Old Golden's Bridge, it took me there back in the in 1995 or whenever I wrote my book uh, about the images of Lewisboro, uh, we went, we parked in the parking lot to the east, <clears throat> east of the Golden Spring Shopping Center, you know, where the post office is today. The eastern part, the, the parking lot closest to the exit where you go back out to the traffic light. And we went up the hillside and we just went through the woods and he knew where he was going and I was following. So I wasn't really looking for landmarks, but it was quite far up on the hillside and it, it's overlook, it's, it's a hillside and you look down into swampy area where there's probably a stream running through. And I think, and keep going east of that, you're gonna end up on colony property, property where the colony is today, but it's, as far as, I don't know who owns it. It might be owned by the shopping center. It's just woods. But if you want to start your explorations, park at that Eastern end of, of the shopping center. And um, I really haven't looked lately to even know if there's fencing or anything up there, but it was all open, accessible when John and I went up there. Okay, we should, everyone should wait for the snow to melt though first. Yeah. Oh yeah, I wouldn't try it now. Well, or after the blizzard, the next blizzard, but great springtime hike because uh, it's probably lots of other stuff up there to see, but I'm sure it's still there. And the, um, in the Katona history book, there's uh, another rock. I don't know where it is. I guess it's someplace between Golden's Bridge and Katona. It's called this, the singing rock. And apparently if you rocked it, it made noise. But, uh, and Here, there's another there's another balanced I rock in the always ask you why is the hamlet called golden's bridge uh, and i meant to say that at the beginning and i forgot uh, so i will say it right now uh nobody really knows the real story but um let's go back to uh maybe george washington the uh, the era of the early 
or middle 1700s, there was a gentleman doing research on the Native Americans way back then in the, the uh, 18th century. And he was writing a book and he was mapping the area. And he apparently put on the map his name and his name was Colden, C-O-L-D-E-N, uh, with a C, not a G. And Washington used that map when he was moving his troops from uh, Ridgebury down toward uh, Lower Westchester. And uh, he said he he used he used Colden's Bridge to cross the Croton River. Croton River. Uh, you can still see it up near Brewster or above, above, uh, above Golden's Bridge. It goes along Route 22, uh, but it was a navigable river. It was used by the Native Americans and it was also used by the early settlers in Golden's Bridge. It was navigable, so it needed the bridge. At some point, the bridge was a toll bridge. Now that's Mr. Colden, but probably it comes from this man uh, <clears throat> Abraham Golding, who is actually uh, a resident of Somers, the other side of the bridge, not the Golden Bridge side of the bridge. And he was a very active Methodist, uh, very active in starting uh, the beginning of the Methodist church in, in Somers called uh, Mount Zion. And that's where Mr. Abraham Golding is buried. But uh, according to something I was reading about Mr. Golding, uh, and it may have been in the Katona history book, that um, his family were Tories, so they had to leave the New York area, and they went up to Nova Scotia. And then after the Revolutionary War, after the war was over, I'm getting my tongue twisted here, uh, he came back to Golden's Bridge area and uh, uh, in like 1796 or something. And he built a better bridge and it was known as Boldings Bridge. But um, Lewisboro, it was on, it was going between the two towns, Stevens Town as Somers was called then and Golden's Bridge or Lewis, Golden's Bridge because it didn't become Lewisboro for a long time. And uh, our early town records uh, have several instances where the town would put up money to repair the bridge. So uh, the bridge was probably, and nobody really knows where it was, but it was probably a little further north of where the highway bridge is now, uh, closer to North Salem, someplace between North Salem and, and here, or Croton Falls rather, Croton Falls in here. But it's probably from Abraham Golding, the ex-Tory who lived in Somers. Okay, well, now we'll see how well you remembered your uh, pictures that you had. Okay. Where exactly on Todd Road, the Todd, Todd Road homestead pictured before the big Brady home. Okay. <clears throat> is it's, that uh, homestead, is it in Lake Katona? No, no. Uh, the one across from Lake Katona was another Brady homestead, Ed Brady, but that was built in the 1840s. The one, uh, the big one, the one, uh, uh, I mean, yeah, the Todd Road. I'm sorry, forget the Brady. Forget I said Brady. It's Brady is the one by Lake Katona. Todd, the Todd Homestead. We can uh, we can go back, I guess. The Todd Homestead is on Todd Road, and it's almost across from Mount Holly, where Mount Holly Road goes up. It sits way back from the road. You can see it from the road. I don't remember what, oh, oops, wrong one. Basically, it looks the same. Uh, it's got a long, a long driveway, but you can see it from the road. The driveway comes up to the side of the house. Um, and it, it's, if you go down Todd Road and you come, I think it's, it's, before you get to where Mount Holly Road goes up on the left-hand side, this is on, on the north side of the road. Uh, and actually what I forgot to say, behind 
the Brady, uh, behind the Todd house is a, another Goldensford Cemetery. It's the Todd Family Cemetery, and it does have a Civil War uh, veteran buried in it. It's a small cemetery, uh, but it's behind the Todd, it's behind the Todd Homestead. And that is not a Todd, it doesn't, Todd's do not own that anymore, but, and I don't know who, I don't know who, it, it's been for sale several different times. I haven't been in it in a long, a long time. Next question is, are there any interesting ghosts of Golden's Bridge that you care to share? I, I, I wish I knew some, I don't, I know, I know of two, one back, Steve Waterbury, for some reason, the guy moved to Michigan, so I don't know why I'm talking about him, but he, uh, he was a great guy when he was our, he was our highway superintendent way back when. Um, he told me a ghost story. It's the only real ghost story told to me by a living person uh, in, involved with Golden Bridge ghosts, but he said as a kid, he grew up in a, his house was uh, uh, Green Hill Road, the, above, above where the, uh, the uh, uh, BMW place is, wherever, one of those roads up there. He grew up in a, a fairly old house there. And uh, he said he slept, he was, I don't know whether he, he or one of his family was sleeping in a bed on the, the ground, in one of the bedrooms or else on the ground floor, someplace in, 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 that house, in the house that he lived in and actually felt a ghost sit on the bed uh, and saw a figure standing at the bottom of the bed. But we can't put any provenance or any background backstory to who that ghost might have been. But then Steve, the other story Steve told me, aside from somebody actually seeing that ghost, and as I say, I can't, I'd have to look at my notes, remember who it was, because I, I never include it, because we never do a ghost tour over there. But Steve said he had this trick with his dog. He'd throw a ball up the stairs, and his dog would go partway up the stairs and then start barking and come back down. And he would never, he, the dog was afraid to go upstairs. And so, we assume there must have been a presence upstairs that was uh, that the dog could sense, even if if uh, people couldn't sense. The other one is uh, this one I read about, and I also made up my own story about it. Uh, Peter Parsons back there said I knew a lot about Golden about about the town history, and what uh, I needed to tell him was what I don't know I make up. So a couple of ghost stories I might embellish on but there was supposed to be a Christmas Eve ghost who was a soldier and uh, I forget whether he was returning from the Revolutionary War or the Civil War but he would appear on Christmas Eve walking from uh, the Purdy direction down toward Golden Bridge and he would come past um, there's a White House right on the cusp of where uh, uh, our town turns into, into uh, North Salem and the, this ghost would walk along between the area between the blazer and coming into, uh, into uh, Golden Spirit. There's a white house, something like this house on the uh, Western side of the road. Uh, the last people that um, I knew there, uh, I'm trying to think. I taught the I taught the kids at at um, at uh, St. Patrick's School, and uh, um, I think I think they're forgetting. I'm forgetting their name. They had red hair. Anyway, it was their house that supposedly this ghost would walk by, and that's a big white uh, early colonial house on the eastern on the western side of the road, not not too far from the Blazer as you come into Golden Bridge. Okay, next question. The remains of Duffy's Bridge, are they the ones visible from 684 south, just north of exit six? There's two stone structures on either side of the water in that area. Uh, could be, and thank you. I was trying to remember the name of Duffy's Bridge Road because uh, I think 
Weeks Street and now Todd Road comes out on onto Route 22. And if you kept going across, you'd end up on Duffy's Bridge Road. And that was the road into Katona. I mean, there was, uh, there was the uh, Route 35 too, but that was a way into Katona until they built 684. So I would imagine what you're seeing is probably uh, involved with Duffy's Bridge that road because it was there when we moved to town in the middle 60s and you, that's the way you could get into Katona. Um, somebody asked if there was any archeological ruins or of interest from the revolutionary times or Native American carvings or ruins. Like I said, we didn't see too much actual military action. We saw the cowboys and the Skinners robbing and stealing. Uh, so, uh, there, there isn't. When the reservoir was down, and I don't know if they're ever going to take it down again, but people could see fishing, fishing the ruins of the fishing weirs, and uh, those were quite visible. So if the reservoir ever goes down again, that's where you'll see uh, archaeological Native American stuff. Uh, in that first map that I showed, uh, the very almost at the very beginning, uh, Evans map where uh, this is this is Golden's Bridge right in here. This is the Croton River. This is the reservoir now. The reservoir comes down this way. Uh, here is what Evan cites as a Kichewan village. And here's another one on the other side, uh, which is probably would be the North Salem side. Now, he, he doesn't have them all. Uh, actually, what I'm looking at here, if he has this as Katona, he doesn't have, um, I, don't, I don't think he's got everything exactly where it, it might possibly be, but I would say I know that there were Native American leavings along this part of the Croton River. So that's Give there. one more shameless plug about your book. It's on sale at the library. If anyone wants to buy it, they probably can contact the Park and Rec and we'll get them in touch with you. Or just, just call the library uh, or call me, you know, call the library. The, the big blue history book, there are 80 left. After that, there are no more. Um, there's some, I bring them to the library when they run out because I have, they, they're stored in our attic, Dana, up there at uh, Onatru. And uh, if we don't want the roof to fall through, we need to get rid of the books. If my own books, the uh, Images of America, Lewis Bro, and the Ghost Stories, and a collection of my columns, you can all buy at the library and the money goes to the library. So uh, you could contact me by email, which is on the town website someplace out there, or, uh, or Park and Rec, and they can get in touch with me if you want my books. They sell for $20, the paperbacks, but the, the big Lewis Bro book would, uh, be a really good read along as we go through our hamlets. So next hamlet is Vista. How and much is the big blue book? I am hesitant to say, usually around Christmas, we sell it for 25 uh, okay. when it originally sold for 40. Don't go to eBay because it's for, I've seen it for 90. Oof. And they're not, it's not even the hardcover, it's the paperback. So uh, do not go to, uh, eBay, go to the library, or go to my website, uh, my uh, email. Any other interesting facts about Duffy's Bridge or Duffy's Bridge Road that you could share? No, I just like the name and it went into Katona and it was, it was sabotaged by the coming of 684. And there, there was, it was, it was another way into Katona, but now it's, it's a, uh, can't do it anymore. But um, given that Katona Village was relocated, were there any efforts to re relocate the village and businesses of Golden's Bridge when 684 was built? No, no. You saw what happened to them. Uh, it, it kind of, well, well, I shouldn't say that because in the late 50, 1959 to 1964, 65, or 69, that's when Golden's Bridge went through this 
you want to call it urban renewal, uh, the town got a three hundred eighty thousand dollar grant from the from the federal government to uh, help finance, and that's when they built the shopping center. That's where they relocated the the stores. So I I stand. <laughs> Correcting myself. That's where the AMP went. That's where uh, there's isn't there a, there's a liquor store. There's a I don't guess the cards. I don't know if the card store is there. There is um, no the card store. I just recently closed down. Mm -hmm. Actually, right. That's what I thought. The, the the post office is there. Yes. I don't know if there's there's a sushi place Acme. But there's yeah, which is net was the AMP is now Acme, but there's no drugstore, right? No. So the drugstore with the uh, that drugstore that I that was on that old picture had a wonderful uh, uh, soda fountain. I was I was told about the soda fountain. It had a soda fountain in it, just like all good drugstores should have. Um, but I don't I don't remember if there ever was a drugstore when they redid that shopping center. Shopping center was supposed to like have a bowling alley and uh, uh, other recreational places, but it never really got, there's a bank there, right? No, it did get a bank. Yes, we got a bank. Yeah, but that's, um, it never, it never, Golden Bridge thought way back in the 1840s when the railroad came, it would become a great metropolis because it had farms. The farmers liked it because it had the depot and they could get their milk and their cows to the, uh, the depot and they could go into New York City or they could uh, go north if they needed to go north. Um, actually, after the railroad came and in, in the early 1900s, uh, there was, because the dairy farming was, was so important, Sheffield Farms uh, Creamery built a creamery there. So there was a milk processing plant right uh, near where King Lumber is. Next one, Polly's home that was donated to the Audubon, was that a farm or another special homestead in town? It's located on Todd Road? Right, that, that was a farm. That was uh, uh, the Morgan Parker, well, the Parkers were the ones that, uh, that donated it to the Audubon, that gave it to the Audubon Society. And uh, before that, uh, I'd have to look at a map. I don't know who it was before that. And then there was, there's another really nice house on a bad curve. That's the picket, it was the picket inn. And uh, it's not too far from the Audubon Society farm. But then there's this other really interesting house. It's pretty close to the wall, the road, but it's on that bad curve. And that, that was an inn, that was the picket inn during uh, the 1800s. So I don't know who owned Parker before Parker's did. I'd have to look. I'd have to look that up. Not to worry. You have a lot of friends on here who are helping you out. There was a pharmacy, at least in the early 1990s, even in the 80s, but nobody remembers what the name was. Okay. I thought there was a drugstore, but as I say, I'm not oriented toward there. I'm oriented toward Richfield, so... Um, and uh, oh, there's a pizza store. Well, now there's a pizza store. Right? Yes, yes. Hooray! It that's... was Portofino's, and now I right. think it's Labella's. Right, right. Uh, but Councilman Tony Gonzalez is helping you out and giving out the contact information to get in contact with you. Somebody okay. else wants to know about all the books you read. I think it's a lot to ask for now. I'll send out a separate email with the list of books with the uh, that you've written, with how to get them. Okay. That Everyone thanks you for your time, your knowledge, and uh, greatly appreciates the chat. Well, I'm sorry I talked so much and I forgot half of what I wanted to tell you, but I'm glad we got Betty Page and the captain in. Does anyone have any live questions that they can, if they want to unmute themselves? No. Okay. Oh, oh wait, Christiana. Yes. Oh, Christy, hold on one second. Dana, it's Mike. Hi. Oh, it's Mike. Sorry, Mike. Christiane's here too. Hello. Oh, hi, Christiane. <laughs> Just curious to know because we're not far from the captain's uh, 
a um, stone house down there. What's going on with that property nowadays? I mean, it's just been dormant for years and years. It was inherited by the cat, one of the captain's nephews. He's a, some sort of a Cossack prince, but he lives in England and he inherited the captain's uh, whatever he had to inherit. And I don't, I don't know. I don't know whether he sold it. He, I haven't heard tell of him in a long time. I met with him once, but he, uh, and he, he, you know, said he was going to give some more stuff to the town, but didn't see anything. Most of the, all the stuff I have came from Amy, Amy Lalone, who was a good friend of the captain. Uh, and, uh, Something else to do with the captain. Um, you saw his grave, right? I showed you his grave. Um, after he passed away, some Cossack group from New Jersey, uh, I don't think they were related at all, but they came up and claimed the captain's body and, and, and arranged for the grave and uh, the interment and uh, uh, made away with some of the more important stuff that was in his house. He had, he had like Russian silver samovars and uh, uh, tea sets and, and I don't know what else, but there was a lot of, uh, a lot of good things that went the way of the Cossacks before uh, the prince came over from, from England. And as I said, I met with him once, he had all sorts of things laid out in, in the garage. Uh, I think I don't think the garage is even there anymore. I don't know. It had a, it had the mom's old car in it, which the captain. <laughs> if you read his letters, that car didn't get him very far. I think he had to push it most more than he drove it. <laughs> so I'd be interested if anybody has any other. Some people on Facebook did say some wonderful things about knowing the captain and. Uh, basically knew him through Amy and especially Maureen Carpenter and my two visits with him. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks guys. Good to see you guys in live. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone else have any questions? Want to share anything? Okay. If not, uh, again, we thank you all for coming. We thank you for sharing your Sunday with us and uh, your Valentine's Day. And remember in two more weeks, we'll be doing another one on Vista. So we hope that you'll join us then. And um, encourage people. I, I hope, I want cross hamlets here. I want us to work mm -hmm. as a town. So uh, uh, invite your friends to tune in for the rest of our five hamlets. And we'll see you soon. Thanks, Maureen. And this will be available. Thanks, uh, because we did video it and uh, it will be available. Hopefully we'll get it on LCTV and up uh, on the town's website to be viewed if you missed it or want to relive it. Thank you again all for attending. Thank you, Maureen. Oh, any, any time, buddy. Bye-bye. <laughs>